The Landlady, a grown-up tale by Roald Dahl. By the time I arrived on the train, it was about nine o'clock, and the moon was coming up out of a clear starry sky over the houses opposite the station entrance. But the air was deadly cold, and the wind was like a flat blade of ice on my cheeks. Having never been in Bath before, I took directions from the porter to some cheap local lodgings, a pub called the Bell and Dragon, and made my way briskly down the street. For briskness was the one common characteristic of all successful businessmen, like those big shots up at the head office. They were always so amazingly brisk. As I studied the once swanky facades of the passing houses now cracked and blotchy with neglect, all of a sudden, in a downstairs window, I caught sight of a printed notice propped up against the glass. It said, Bed and Breakfast. I stopped walking. I moved a bit closer. There was a vase of yellow chrysanthemum standing just underneath the notice that looked wonderful beside the green velvety curtains. I went right up and peered through the glass. Well, there's a nice fire burning the hearth. Look, a pretty little dachshund curled up asleep in front of it. Hmm, pleasant enough furniture. A large parrot in that cage back there. Animals are usually a good sign in this sort of place. All in all, looks far more comfortable than the Bell and Dragon. Though, on the other hand, a pub would be more congenial than a boarding house. Well, perhaps then I shall walk on and take a look before making up my mind. I turned to go. And now a queer thing happened to me. All at once my eye was caught and held in the most peculiar manner by the small notice that was there. Bed and breakfast, it said. Bed and breakfast. Bed and breakfast. Each word was like a large black eye staring at me through the glass, holding me, compelling me. And the next thing I knew, I was climbing the steps to the front door and reaching for the bell. The woman at this door popped out so fast, she was like a jack-in-the-box. It made me jump. Oh, please come in. The desire to follow after her into that house was extraordinarily strong. I saw the notice in the, in the window. Yes, I know. I was wondering about a room. It's all ready for you, my dear. I was on my way to the Bell and Dragon, but... The, the notice in your window just happened to catch my, my eye. My dear boy, why don't you come in out of the cold? How much do you charge? Five and sixpence a night, including breakfast. Fantastically cheap. If that is too much, then perhaps I can reduce it just a tiny bit. It would be sixpence less without an egg for breakfast, if you'd like. Five and sixpence is fine. I should like very much to stay here. I knew you would. Do come in. Just hang your hat there. Let me help you with your coat. I'm afraid we have the house all to ourselves. You see, it isn't very often I have the pleasure of taking a visitor onto my little nest. I should have thought you'd be simply swamped with applicants. I am, my dear, I am. Of course I am. But the trouble is that I'm inclined to be just a teeny-weeny bit choosy in particular, if you see what I mean. Ah, uh, yes. But I'm always ready. Everything is always ready day and night in this house. Just on the off chance that an acceptable young gentleman would come along. And it is such a great pleasure, my dear. Such a very great pleasure. When now and again I open the door and I see someone standing there who's just exactly right. Like you. The second floor is mine, and this one is all yours. Here's your room. I do hope you like it. The morning sun comes right in the window, Mr. Perkins. It is Mr. Perkins, isn't it? No, it's Weaver. Mr. Weaver, how nice. I put a water bottle between the sheets to air them out, Mr. Weaver. It's such a comfort to have a hot water bottle in a strange bed with clean sheets, don't you agree? And you may light the gas fire at any time if you feel chilly. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. I'm so glad you appeared. I was beginning to get worried. Well, that's all right. You mustn't worry about me. Very well, then. I'll leave you now so you can unpack. But before you go to bed, would you be kind enough to pop into the sitting room on the ground floor and sign the book? Everyone has to do that, because it's the law of the land and we don't want to go breaking any laws at this stage in the proceedings, do we? Mm, she's slightly off a rocker, but at this price, what of it? After all, she's not only harmless, but also quite obviously a kind and generous soul. Probably just lost a son in the war, I suppose. So a few minutes later, I trotted downstairs to the living room. 
The landlady wasn't there, but the fire was glowing warm on the hearth, and the little dachshund was still sleeping soundly in front of it. I found the guest book lying open on the piano, so I took out my pen and wrote down my name and address. There were only two other entries above mine on the page, and as one always does with guest books, I started to read them. Hmm, that's funny. This name, Christopher Mulholland, rings a bell. Now, where on earth have I heard that name before? Now that I think of it, that second name has something familiar about it as well. Gregory Temple, Christopher Mulholland. Such charming boys. They sound somehow familiar. They do? How interesting. I'm almost positive I've heard those names before somewhere. Isn't that odd? Maybe it was in the newspapers. They weren't famous in any way, were they? Famous? Oh, no, I don't think they were famous. They were incredibly handsome, both of them. Just exactly like you, my dear. Look here. This last entry is over two years old. Dear me, I never would have thought it. How time does fly away from all of us, doesn't it, Mr. Wilkins? It's Weaver. Of course it is. How silly of me, I do apologise. Now, dear, come over here, sit down beside me on the sofa, and I'll give you a nice cup of tea and a ginger biscuit before you go to bed. You really shouldn't bother. I didn't mean you to do anything like that. I'm almost positive it was in the newspapers I saw them. I'll think of it in a second, I'm sure I will. Wait a minute, wait just a minute. Christopher Mulholland, wasn't that the name of the Eaton schoolboy who was on a walking tour through the West Country? Milk and sugar? Uh, yes, please. And then all of a Milk sudden... schoolboy? Oh, no, my dear, that can't possibly be right. Because my Mr. Mulholland was certainly not an Eaton schoolboy when it came to me. He was a Cambridge undergraduate. Come over here now and sit next to me and warm yourself in front of this lovely fire. Come on, your tea's all ready for you. There we are. How nice and cosy this is, isn't it? As we sipped our tea in silence, I knew that she was looking at me. Her body was half turned toward me, and I could feel her eyes resting on my face, watching me over the rim of her teacup. Oh, oh Mr. Maholland was a great one for his tea. Never in my life have I seen anyone drink as much tea as dear sweet Mr. Maholland. I suppose he left fairly recently. Left? But my dear boy, he never left. He's still here. Mr. Temple is also here. They're on the fourth floor, both of them together. How old are you, my dear? Seventeen. Seventeen? Oh, it's the perfect age. Mr. Mulholland was also seventeen, but I think he was a trifle shorter than you are. In fact, I'm sure he was, and his teeth weren't quite so white. You have the most beautiful white teeth, Mr. Weaver. Did you know that? They're not as good as they look. They've got simply masses of fillings in them at the back. Mr. Temple, of course, was a little older. He was actually 28, and yet I never would have guessed it if he hadn't told me. Never in my whole life. There wasn't a blemish on his body. A what? His skin was just like a baby's. That parrot in the corner, you know something? It, it had me completely fooled when I first saw it through the window. I could have sworn it was alive. Alas, no longer. It's most terribly clever, the way it's been done. It doesn't look in the least bit dead. Who did it? I did. You did? Of course. And have you met my sweet little Basil as well? I realised that the dachshund had been just as silent and motionless as the parrot. I put out a hand and touched it gently on the back. It was hard and cold, and when I pushed the hair to one side, I could see the greyish-black skin underneath, perfectly preserved. Good gracious me, how absolutely fascinating. It must be awfully difficult to do a thing like that. Oh, not at the least. I stuff all my little pets myself when they pass away. Will you have another cup of tea? No, thank you. The tea tasted faintly of bitter almonds, and I didn't much care for it. Oh, you did sign the book, didn't you? Oh, yes. Oh, good. Because later on, if I happen to forget what you were called, then I can always come down here and look it up. I still do that almost every day with Mr. Mulholland and Mr... Oh, Mr. Temple, Gregory Temple, excuse my asking, but haven't there been any other guests here except them in the last five years? No, my dear!